having worked with digital currencies since the late 90s. My background is in um, uh, video games, uh, specifically massively multiplayer games, the, the first of those being sort of Meridian 59, Ultima, EverQuest, eventually things like World of Warcraft, Second Life, and, and more. Um, I recognized early on that the intangible um, assets, the virtual currency or goods that exist in these persistent worlds had value. And so I was the primary market maker for the world's virtual economies. I built a supply chain in 2002, three or four of 400,000 people in China that were playing these games professionally for us uh, to mine digital currency that we sold into foreign markets. Uh, I had 99% market share in South Korea and I did this all over the world. Uh, and my main investor was Goldman Sachs uh, Principal Strategies back in 2006 and I was their first private investment because I was running a more complex proprietary trading operation in terms of number of markets uh, than they were by far, um, which eventually led to getting into this space. Um, and um, when looking at the opportunities in this space, I couldn't figure out what to do. There were too many interesting things, and the only way I could play it at that time was trying to incubate. And so I was starting a, a business, uh, call it every two months in the space, from payment-related things. I founded Tether and you know, a bunch of things. I was one of the founding board members of MasterCoin. Uh, we did the first ICO. We invented the ICO back in uh, very early 2013, and that occurred in June of 2013, which led to a lot of these other things. But um, that eventually led to, I can't get enough scale. My, my time doesn't scale. There's not enough of me to go around from an execution perspective. So if I want to impact sort of the enterprise development in the ecosystem, the best way to do that was as a venture capitalist, because there were none at the time. There was no one really investing in this space, certainly not dedicated to it. So Blockchain Capital was the first venture fund established to invest exclusively in this area. Uh, we've made about 75, um, we're invested in roughly 75 companies through funds one, two, and three. Um, I'm no longer running Blockchain Capital's subsequent funds. Um, the last kind of thing that I did in venture is what I like doing, which is disrupting um, industries for the benefit, benefit of all of the ecosystem's participants. And that was in digitizing our last, um, uh, our third fund, where we did the first digital security, where um, instead of our, like traditional funds, it would only be available to call it the financial elite, pensions, endowments, and high net worth family offices. And it was a completely democratized fund. Uh, we raised it in roughly 16 minutes due to some technical issues. It took six hours, but we raised a fund in you know six hours or less uh, from about 800 LPs around the world and. Uh, it's an entirely liquid venture fund in the sense that uh, instead of having your money tied up for eight to ten years, you're able to trade your tokenized LP interest. Um, so bringing liquidity to an illiquid market and democratization I found to be an interesting sort of way of disrupting venture, which I think will end up being the demise of venture capital in its current structure as we know it. It'll take about five to ten years. But I think it's going to have the same impact on private equity and REITs and you know, any of these illiquid assets uh, that exist that are primarily only available to the financial elite. And not to say that the large institutions of the world are going to be the largest investors um, because they've got the most resources, but um, uh, it's still, uh, it's nice to see that it's more of a level playing field and available to everyone. Um, and so since having done that, uh, most of my time uh, these days is spent uh, supporting uh, Block One and, and, and EOS. I like this, uh, just for some of you that may not have seen this, uh, I like to set the context um, because most people don't understand blockchains very well. You're relatively new to it, even if you've been around for a year. I mean, I'm learning every single day, and my mind continually is blown on a regular basis, and I've only worked exclusively in this space for the last six years, uh, and I've seen a lot. <laughs> but uh, I like to take us back to, to 1994. Um, this was the, uh, the Today Show. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At? See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. Um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. Around I'd never heard it about, said. I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> yeah, well, I heard it around the big fight in the lunchroom. The See, week. there it is. Violence at NBC. GE com. I mean. Well, what well, Allison what, should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big. How does one? What do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. With, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in ten seconds or less. Oh, <laughs> oh. Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is, what does it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up made up of uh, started from 
Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's like a, look a in computer the billboard. It's, it's not in there. It's, it, it's, it's a computer billboard, but it's nationwide. Right. And it's, it's several uh, universities and everything all joined together. And right. And others can access it. And, right. And it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. It just came great. in really handy during the quake. A lot of people, that's how they were communicating out to tell family and loved ones they were okay because all the phone lines were down. I was telling Katie and I was But you don't, need, you, don't need that, you don't need a phone line to operate no. internet? No, no. They're talking about what is internet anyway and clearly have no idea what it is. And this is mainstream media talking to everyone. The point being is when technologies are new, they generally are not well understood. And, uh, and as a result of that, you know, we have some misperceptions. Um, by 1995... Newsweek was talking about how the internet was going to fail, uh, and that was because the internet was primarily used by, you know, criminals, bad people, things that, you know, they thought didn't have any, any purpose in the world, and this is true of most emerging systems, because the earliest adopters of new technologies are often the fringe users that need it the most, but that doesn't really have any bearing on the long term of things. I mean, the adult industry is largely responsible for most of the technology we have today. So does that make technology bad? You know, because a lot of people will ask questions. Well, what about Bitcoin? Isn't it used for X, Y, and Z? Okay, yeah, not everything is perfect, um, but nor are any other systems. Uh, so I like to talk about that. They said it's a fad and it was going away. And by the year 2000, after we had gone through the internet bubble and boom and bust, there were no VCs in the world willing to invest in an internet company in 2001. I mean, it was toxic beyond belief, and that's only 17 years ago, 16 years ago. This is a sector that was literally uninvestable because all of the financial minds of the world were convinced that the internet you know, may have some utility, but there would never be businesses built there. And this is why you even have public companies like eBay trading below cash. Well, it's de proven it's a legitimate and you know, potentially a very good business, but there was no one in the world that, that would agree with that. And um, you know, I think that this is just an interesting um, perspective as we start to think about another new technology that is probably somewhere in that 1994, 1999, I mean 1995, uh, phase in its development. And so uh, uh, this is kind of one of the big drivers of it, um, and that is uh, uh, decentralized systems. If, and one, one of my, probably the best book uh, written on the subject is the, uh, the Starfish and the Spider. And it's because, um, does anyone know what happens if you cut the leg off a spider? It walks with a limp. Uh, <laughs> if you cut a second leg off, more of a limp, it's, head, it's dead. But with a starfish, on the other hand, when you cut the leg off the starfish, it grows back. But if you get any of the center of the starfish with that leg, that leg becomes an entirely new starfish. If you cut it five ways across, it will become five starfish. It's the best example of decentralized sort of systems existing in nature. Um, and this is a book that doesn't talk about technology. It talks about decentralized systems, and they exist all over the place. And that's one of the big macro trends that's enabling all of this. It's um, the world is moving from centralized systems to decentralized distributed systems. And that's not the only trend. Obviously, open source software and, and hardware are the other two. Uh, historically, the open source software movement uh, was a voluntary one. It was one where great people contributed their time either for some glory, some credit, or for philanthropic causes because they had a belief that this was something important and they needed to contribute to it. But you're never going to get mass adoption of these types of ideals in a very short period of time without a stronger incentive. And what the blockchain and tokens have done is it's created an economic incentive to open source the world. And it's not going to happen at a slow pace, which is what we've been experiencing more or less up and until now. It can now happen rapidly because if you want to see mass adoption of any system, it needs to be like improving what exists by an order of magnitude. It has to be so much better than what exists historically that it essentially makes the old paradigm obsolete. Um, and so that's what's happening here by adding tokenization to the open source side of things, obviously on the hardware side as well, and then we're moving from centralized to decentralized systems. Um, and we're seeing you know, some of these things happening all over the place, Uber being the largest you know, taxi sort of company in the world but has no taxis. Facebook is the world's largest media company but makes no content. Alibaba is the biggest retailer but doesn't have any inventory. Airbnb, same thing with accommodations. Bitcoin right now is the fastest growing bank in the world but with no employees or branches. And you know, we're going to see a continuation of these types of trends. Uh, but these platforms are going to be open source and decentralized. <coughs> now, where are we at in terms of, you know, it's 20, uh, late 2017. Um, and this is kind of the big inflection point. I think 2018 is the year where kind of we, we're going to step out of being in sort of the prototype phase to 
you know, everything starts to get real and, and scalable. Um, but here's kind of where the adoption is going to happen in the short term. Because I was approached by not really anybody today, but um, for the last five or six years, it was pretty regular, uh, certainly out at dinner parties, any, you know, sort of public place. You know, if the topic of conversation was Bitcoin or blockchains, that someone, you know, would want to come up and be the antagonist. You know, someone that had read a couple of news stories and they thought because of a sensational headline they actually knew what they were talking about. Um, and so they would, you know, try to start an argument. They'd come up to me and they'd say, Brock, Brock, why should I want Bitcoin? And I would always use sort of a reverse psychology technique on them and then I would say, you shouldn't. And they'd go, what do, what do you mean, why shouldn't? I go, well, it's not for you. And this would really kind of get them going, what do you mean not for me? I go, well, do you have a bank account? And they're like, yes. And I go, I'm guessing you got a piece of plastic in your pocket that lets you conveniently pay for things too. And at this point, they're like, okay, I've been played, uh, yeah. And I go, yeah, you've got rule of law here that's here in theory to protect you, and in many cases, it often will. You probably have faith in the system, so much so to the point that you're arguing with someone when you don't know what you're talking about. And of the 200 currencies in the world, you've got one that everyone wants more of. This is going to improve your lives by one or 2%. And I'm guessing you don't get up every day to clip coupons. But now if we go south of the border, because these were conversations typically happening in America, You'll learn about Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa, that you've got places with hyperinflation, Venezuela in particular right now. You've got things like what have happened in Cyprus. Did you know the most advanced payment market in the world is Kenya? Did you know that over 68% of all payments in Kenya are done with uh, uh, mobile phones and it's not using fiat money? The primary form of money in Kenya is prepaid cell phone minutes. Uh, it's a Vodafone subsidiary called Safaricom that makes a product called M-Pesa. This digital prepaid cell phone minute is the primary currency of Kenya. And that's because in these regions, just like they leapfrogged wired telecommunications and went straight to wireless, you don't have incumbent infrastructure. You just have great need. And in places where the need is the greatest is where you're going to see the adoption happen the fastest. And so you've got you know, 3 billion people on the planet that don't have any financial services whatsoever. You have another 2 to 3 billion people on the planet with limited financial services. And this is where you know, we have an opportunity to democratize everything in a way where the, you know, it's going to impact billions of people's lives positively. And it's going to be the least fortunate people on the planet that benefit the most. To these people that had those comments, I go, it's not for you. you know, it, the way that it's going to affect your life is if you want to speculate. But based upon your comments, I don't think you're the speculator. Um, you might be the shorter. And, you know, I, the only thing I'd encourage you is don't make that mistake. Um, uh, uh, you're better off just keep criticizing from the sidelines. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, these are, these are the sort of macro trends that are happening on that front. And then on the other side, it's the big enterprises in the developed world. You know, it's going to be the enterprises. When I used to go to the, uh, uh, the financial institutions in the space, uh, they would ask me, hey, Brock, is, you know, is, you know, the 2013, 2014, 2015, I spent a lot of my time educating banks and regulators and such around the world. I've, I've more or less stopped with that job because there's plenty of other people that can do it. And most of them are educated well enough at this point, they don't need me to do so. The argument that I would have is they'd say, is this good or bad for my business? And I said, it's both. Of course it's both. There's going to be, this technology is going to negatively impact certain aspects of your business and it's going to enhance certain aspects of your business. You know, an analogy that I think is probably suitable to you would be voice over IP. When voice over IP came along, everybody said, oh, this is going to be the end of the telecoms and, you know, it's going to be all free internet calling and X, Y, and Z. What actually happened? The telecoms co-opted the technology, re-architected their middle and back offices and their margins expanded and it was a huge benefit to their business, but not all of them. You know, in the typical innovator's dilemma, the incumbents that acted early were the bigger beneficiaries and the ones that acted late may not exist anymore. And these are the things that you have to ask yourself. And what you probably want to do is conduct a SWOT analysis on every aspect of your business to determine which businesses, you know, are going to be the beneficiaries of this technology. And so that's starting to happen. Um, again, uh, uh, over the course of, call it 2014, 2015, the major financial institutions started to play with the technology. That continued to accelerate with, you know, kind of everybody um, playing with the technology to some degree from an experimenting perspective. And it's really now and, and, and next year where you're seeing these, uh, it's really more next year than this year, where you're starting to see these pilots, you know, are going to become something more like production. And when we go production is when things start to get real. Because right now, most of it is just a prototype. And most of it is theoretical things that are going to be developed. Because most of the infrastructure isn't there to do so. I mean, blockchains today are really only being used for two things successfully. You know, Bitcoin is a kind of store of value, gold 2.0. Digital gold is kind of 
that one area in which Bitcoin is actually serving a market need, you know, and uh, uh, facilitating faster and easier movement of money that runs 24 hours a day. And then the other thing is uh, cap uh, uh, capital formation. You know, the ICO essentially is Ethereum's killer app at this point. You know, it's changing the way in which, you know, startups are being financed. Um, and so this is a global phenomenon. It's happening everywhere. More or less every major smart investor in the space is, um, has, is participating. The only one that wasn't was Sequoia, um, but that's changed now too. So I guess they're on the bandwagon. Uh, so here's some interesting data. Uh, having been in the venture side of the market and financing the enterprises in the space, um, in 2014, the sector brought in as much capital as the internet did as a sector in 1995. In uh, 2015, we brought in nearly as much capital as the internet did as a sector in 1996. So when I talk about these analogies, uh, it's, it's interesting to see you know, kind of how the capital has come into the space because the money that comes in today takes time before you see the products and services, you know, the bridges, the roads, the tunnels, the basic infrastructure that's being developed from it, and it becomes available to consumers. That takes a couple of years before you normally see the benefits uh, of it. And the other big thing that's changed is those numbers were at a time when it would cost you $5 million to make a website to sell shoes online. And it would take you a very long time with Amazon Web Services, with open source software, with uh, uh, um, you know, uh, software as a service, and with all of the other things we're developing. I mean, major innovations can you know, get done with very little capital. But what you'll notice here is in 2016, we, we, we went flat. But what didn't go flat was the number of entrepreneurs coming into the space with new ideas and projects. And the quality of the entrepreneurs, you know, continuing to improve. I mean, having spoken to audiences, audiences in this space since the beginning of conferences in, in this space, uh, I can tell you it's, 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 I'm, I'm seeing something very different than what I saw five years ago. Um, and what I see is progress. What I see is more and more people from different, you know, sort of skills and modalities showing up to make a difference in this space. And so because the capital, the generalist VCs stopped providing capital to, to continue to innovate. The entrepreneurs, being as tenacious as they are, didn't stop. They didn't say, hey, sorry, the generalist VCs aren't interested. I guess I better go back to what I was doing. They said, this ICO thing looks really interesting as an alternative. There's lots of crypto people that have you know, accumulated now large amounts of wealth. They're going to understand the things I'm working on. You know, they might be interested in supporting and contributing to the things that I want to do. And so last year, we ended up with about 64 ICOs raising $103 million if you exclude the Dow. The Dow, though, raised a lot of money. And the Dow ended up being a tragic you know, uh, event, but something we can learn from. And that is that security is paramount and there's not any room for error. But it showed us one other thing. It showed that this ICO model is capable of scaling. It went from the entrepreneurs that couldn't raise money from the VCs doing ICOs to the entrepreneurs that can raise money from any VC saying, I prefer an ICO. Because you've demonstrated that this is a better form of uh, 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 collecting the resources necessary to pursue your idea. You know, we've, the model has surpassed venture. It's improved beyond that. And you know, there's some pretty good, you know, interesting data. So right now, over $2 billion has been you know, contributed in the space to entrepreneurs so far this year, and obviously continuing to ramp. This data is really interesting, and that is that in Q2, that ICOs have taken in four times the capital of early stage venture globally. You know, when I say that BCAP was the death of venture capital and you know, it'll take five to 10 years to, to, to happen, it, it's possible that it could be a lot faster. <laughs> if, if these trends continue, uh, venture doesn't have much time at all. Um, but I want to move on th from this because I'm convinced the blockchain is a technology that is going to change the world. Um, and uh, you know, who's interested in being a billionaire or meeting billionaires? I want to meet every billionaire in the world. Um, but to me, a billionaire is not someone with you know, a billion pieces of paper or resources. I'm not interested in money or what money you have. Uh, a billionaire to me is someone that is going to impact the lives of a billion people positively. You know, I'm looking for superheroes with superpowers that are going to bring their skills to the table to improve the lives of everyone else. And uh, you know, when you have a technology that's going to change the world, technology isn't conscious. Technology isn't good or bad. It's an enabling thing and it's going to enable us to change the world. And that could be for the worse, and that could be for the better. Our future is going to be determined by the quality of people that do it, and you know, do they act you know, with purpose and intention and meaning. And there's a big paradigm shift occurring, and that is that money is not going to be power much longer. 
this old adage of money being power, that paradigm is coming to an end. The future paradigm is technology is power. Consciousness is power. It's not going to be resources. Having money won't buy you a seat at the table anymore. Uh, you're going to have to actually show up and contribute something more than old world resources. Um, which I think is just you know, interesting things as we start thinking about how this technology is going to impact the world in front of us. And I like to look at this because I think it, human beings are inherently good and human beings you know, inherently want to do good. Um, you know, it's, the, it's the architecture of the world in which we live that sometimes causes us to make compromises around our integrity um, and where we're being something less than the ideal human, um, being something less than our, the best version of ourselves. And ultimately, ikigai is, I think, an interesting sort of concept, uh, which is combining all of those things in such a way that you're doing what you love at the top, you're doing what the world needs on the right, you're doing what you can get remunerated for, something that's going to help you survive, and you're also taking advantage of your superpowers or what your skills are. And when you've done that, you've found you know, the ideal place from which you can live with purpose. And what I'm finding you know, from entrepreneurs in this space and what you know, makes me get up in the morning uh, having barely slept every day is the fact that I'm watching more and more people find a life of purpose and a life of meaning. You know, most people are looking for something bigger, something more. And what you'll find is you get deeper and deeper into this space is you'll start to understand that there's something a lot bigger happening here than most of you realize. Something that is gonna fundamentally change the world around us and probably for the better. Um, and this is you know, kind of one of my models also, which is this concept of Kaizen, and that is that Kai being changed and Zen being better Every moment of every day, we're continually trying to improve to be the best versions of ourselves. And you know, just, these are just things that have meaning to me, which doesn't really have anything to do with the topic at hand, but I, I think it does. Because again, I think of this is a technology that's going to change the world. And again, it's our actions and it's the people that we enable that are going to determine the outcome. You know, I think it's the culture that will save us. Um, and I encourage everyone you know, to believe, because everything Everything and anything is possible.